I titled this show Paradiso. Uh, it obviously comes from uh, the Dante uh, novel of the same name. I, I chose it a while ago, actually. I had been um, looking at a couple different artists who use the reproduction of um, iconographic imagery. Uh, I had just completed this series of Fra Angelico reproductions that I gave some kind of twist to. Um, none of them are in this show, and I have, uh, you know, since parted ways with them, but they were some of the first paintings that I did right after Becky gave birth to our first baby, Sophie. Uh, so, like, my entire life had just gotten turned upside down, and um, this, like, next phase, I guess, of painting or, like, making art now being a dad had just started. So I, what I was doing every day is I would wake up early in the morning whenever she got up, which was like 5 a.m. And I would put her in a wrap and I would stand there and like I had to get rid of all the dangerous things around my painting setup and I would just paint with her attached to me. And I got this absolute slice of perfection and uh, uh, this calm sort of sweetness and centeredness uh, and you know, I started this architectural series uh, maybe four or five years ago now, and this iteration of it became a, a way to experiment with uh, perceptions of the perfect or perceptions of, of peace within um, what peace feels like in a place. And also the kind of the flip side of that, you know, there's always uh, an undercurrent to being a new parent. Well, it's incredibly joyful. It's incredibly taxing and challenging. And I didn't know what I was doing. Nobody knows what they're doing when they first start. And so I not only was thinking of like the joys that these places of peace bring to us and how architecture talks to us and comforts us and shields us and gives us a home, but also how architecture can be a way of confining or um, a method of control. These paintings have undercurrents, I think, of everything is not okay also. And of course, they uh, were started, uh, these paintings were started at the beginning of the pandemic, really, right when Sophie was born. So there's this, duality to them. Uh, there is the, the Paradiso side of things, the uh, gesture towards the garden, towards the perfect, towards the divine and the sacred. And there's also the, uh, I think, cancellation of that or the um, suggestion that all may not be as it seems and perhaps this little slice of the perfect is uh, surrounded by a ruin <laughs> or it is no more. Uh, there's always, there's always something outside the garden walls that is there for us to remember. I do have this um, this duality of architectural uh, like supports that they seem to uh, like they have to prop up these structures, um, even though the structures themselves typically you know they're not they're not careworn or weathered. Um, they have this almost plasticized or rendered feel to them. Um, the supports, uh, I, in, in my mind, when I add these supports to these structures, um, there's always this uh, energy and intention that like this must stay standing no matter what. And I think to me that comes from a place of uh, the, when we, when we think of like important places, uh, whether it's, you know, they're real places or they're places that we glean from dreams or imagining or whatever, um, they, they live with us forever and they become so uh, vital to our, our well-being that uh, for them to collapse or to change is, is incredibly unnerving. Um, especially for me, uh, when, I, when I set out to create a place, I will not just, you know, sit there and imagine something. I'll have an idea and what I'll do is I'll, I'll build a maquette first. I'll build some kind of structure so I can have a thing to hold and that actually gives me something to work from. And so as I create these spaces, they go through iterations and layers of like I create them once and then from that model I create them again. And sometimes I create them a, a third time. 
Um, so it might go from sketch to model to drawing to painting through, uh, you know, three or four different spaces that are all the same. And with each pass, kind of like in life when you revisit a space and a new event happens there, um, it becomes more uh, personal or more vital. And I think those jacks or supports that hold the walls up, uh, they do come from a place of anxiety that uh, what would happen if these walls crumbled or what would happen if we let the outside in and the inside out. Um, there's a tension there. And it's not always clear to me uh, why the tension needs to be. Um, but, you know, that tension exists in every, every building that we have in our lives. Like, we, we don't always just open them up. We, we control these thresholds and they, we control these thresholds and they become, um, you know, not just physical entry points, but sort of, uh, conceptual, spiritual entry points into our own interiority. So, like, this, this art, architectural lexicon of, of stuff, like, it's, immediately applicable and, and translatable to the body and to how we feel about like our personhood and our being and our um, yeah there's there's all sorts of richness there that like you can explore just with buildings and no words and it's immediately readable immediately relatable so yeah that's the that's the supports and to uh, to kind of flip it the other way to talk about the um, the other architectures in the painting uh, that that feel progressive, that are building towards something. I do have a ton of ladders in my work. Um, and for me, the ladders are always this point of, uh, I don't know, sort of an, an everyday moment of transcendence that's possible. Uh, I mean, you climb a ladder eight feet in the air and you're up there and like, why would we, you're never up there. Up there is a really unusual way to see the world, even if it's a space that you're in every day of your life. like. Being on a ladder changing a light bulb in your living room, uh, it feels so unusual and it's a little bit out of body, um, you know, eight feet taller than I should be. Uh, that and I think that uh, they're just really functional objects, they feel human. Uh, I've animated them before so, you know, that it looks like they move by themselves. Um, and for me they have a really strong correlation to uh, performance and uh, the world of theater which I have. Uh, some strong roots in. So th they're a very potent symbol for me, um, as well as a stand-in for like this temporary kind of like, we must erect something quick, go to the ladder, the ladder room, <laughs> get all the ladders. <laughs> I think I have done ladders and supports in the past together, but you know, it is this, it is this awesome, um, you know, it's really two, two sides of the same coin in my mind because one, it has to prop up the structure in order to keep it stable, but the other is there to escape it or to go over it or to, um, I don't know, access that one high window 20 feet up in the air. Uh, that's, uh, it always feels out of reach until it isn't. Uh, yeah, there's, there, there are a lot of influence I have, influences I have, I think, that, that play with that idea of the ladder or the idea of going up or over or through something. I, I look at a lot at Giorgio de Chirico and I think it's, it's pretty obvious in the paintings that these are empty cityscapes. They use, you know, very um, warm colors, but they've got this unnervingness to them. There's always this shotgun space perspective going on um, and there's something held out of sight. That ladder is the thing that gives you the hope that you can reach that and untangle that mystery or um, look around that corner or up over that wall. And that is, that for me is just an extremely potent place to be in a, in a painting or in a space is right on the cusp of discovery but not knowing yet. I, I do take a lot of, of notes from, um, you know, like early 20th century, late 19th century, like surrealism, the Spanish surrealists in particular, and I, do think very deeply about symbolism, but I also, like, I try not to get so caught up in it that, like, it becomes didactic, like A means B, uh, because, man, what a way to kill fun and kill a painting is to take the mystery out of it and make it a book. Uh, and not that books are bad, books are great, but if I wanted to write a book, I'd write a book, and if I wanted to leave something hanging in the air. If I wanted to leave something hanging in the air, that's why I make a painting. 
and like that's what makes me stay with a work of art not always just mystery but like there is it is unsolved and it requires you the viewer to come and like be here explore this habitat and like understand why these things are unsolved and how you are like as a viewer critical to that so um the the figures that i use uh i, th I think i have a, a pretty clear timeline of how they developed for me so the figures f in the first place relate straight to the architecture because the architecture it's so denuded of of text basically there's there's no freezes there's no capitals there's no um, architectural detail telling us why or how or who these civilizations sprung up and uh, you know became inhabited they're incredibly clean um, and clean in the sense that they they don't have you know writing on them they don't tell their own story except through the language of space through entrances and exits and um, the figures I think do that same thing they are these uh, blobby uh, sort of black holes. They gesture and they do all the things that humans would do, but they're removed from, from a cultural context. And so they, I think in a way they're, they're quite universal, but at the same time they can act out such particular things with their gestures that um, it's almost like a shadow play for me. Um, I, and I, t I use that actually quite literally, shadow play, because they originated when I started doing the sand animations. I did play with doing, you know, more complex figures in the sand, and I have a few in this show of, you know, hands and, and figures that are, are a little bit more detailed. But uh, when I came back to the paintings, I thought to myself that, you know, this is a way that I can use these forms to primarily they, and I can use these forms to like chiefly explore space and move through space and that is their function for this painting and we don't need to know that much more about them right now because they're doing something, they're an action rather than you know like a whole web of, of cultural contexts. It, when, when something is, is so uh, simplified in terms of its form, um, yes, it's, it's in, immediate, you're immediately able as a viewer to project so much onto it, and that is a really dangerous place to be as an artist because it could go either way. Um, for me, you know, these uh, shadowy forms that I use, they, um, you know, in, the, in their sort of purest form, they, they live and they breathe and they act and uh, do everything just like, you know, anyone from anywhere might, right? They take care of their children, they seek shelter from the rain, uh, they look at the sky and watch the clouds, uh, they survive and they, they thrive and they um, fall in love and hold hands and all sorts of things. But those gestures, which, you know, are, are not always universal, I have to think to myself every time I create a, a painting or an animation with those figures of, um, what what can I kind of get away with in terms of how specific and gestural they can be? Um, how big can I make that emotion or that action? Um, and uh, really the best thing that I can do and the advice that I'm often given as an artist or performer or whatever is just do less. And um, they're so simple that just really slow, a simple gesture can say so much. And I think that happens a lot in the longer animation with the, the parent and child um, exploring the city. I, uh, I think those small intimate gestures say everything about that relationship and about their relationship to that city and to their own thoughts. Um, so yeah, incredibly potent figures, uh, but yeah, da dangerous to say too much or do too much with them. So much of my work is about leaving things unsaid. And um, like I, I said earlier, it's, it's sort of this shadow play. That's the way that I, I grew up and I'm so lucky to have grown up with performance and theater. And um, I am just a real lover of, of good stories. And I so strongly and powerfully believe that like architecture is filled with them. It, it has, it contains the ghosts of every story we've ever lived. Like our our homes know us so intimately that our you know to our our sensibilities and our minds and our dreams like that our our walls become filled with 
the essence of ourselves. Uh, we dream when we dream. We're in those places. You know, when you think when you have a dream, you're like, oh yeah. I was in my childhood home, but it was kind of like this other place. And then it was kind of like, you know, this park that I once went to. And they all blend together and they become so potent because they're incredibly engraved in our bodies and our minds. And um, yeah, that's, I think that's the, the pitch that I try to give about my work every time is that architecture and um, crystallizing those moments around it is just, it's really really vital to me and uh, it's important for us to dream and to inhabit these spaces and to have you know that that moment and that place for just poetry and quiet uh, and to let it all hang in the air.